Hey everybody, it's Charles from HumbleMechanic.com today taking your questions on adding a coolant temperature sensor, cleaning aluminum headlights shutting off, and more. This is episode 258 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. All right, if you want to get a question on a show like this, email me, charles at HumbleMechanic.com. Be sure to put question for Charles in that subject line. Ask the question, give me some space, then give me the details of said question. Also, if you'd prefer to listen, these and many other videos are available in audio-only format on iTunes, Stitcher, Google, and of course over at HumbleMechanic.com. All right, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. And real quick, if you want to score some amazing discounts to places like these listed right here, as well as support the show, check out the crew membership program. There's links to that and everything else we're going to talk about today, of course, down in the description. All right, that's wrapped up. Let's hit these questions. First one up is from Jason. My dad gave me his VW Beetle Sport 1.8 Turbo. I watch your videos anytime. I can't find a fix on the Beetle, and I'm in the process of installing a coolant temperature gauge on the Beetle. I can't stand not knowing how hot the engine is running. I've watched your boost gauge video, helped a lot. I didn't know where to put the vacuum gauge until the video. Thanks for the help on that one. My question for this one is where would I put the temperature sensor probe and does it have to be in a port in the block or would I need to get an adapter? Which I can do, but I don't know the inner diameter of the upper radiator hose. If you could help me, that would be awesome. Thanks. P.S. The temperature sensor is 1 8 on 27 NPT. All right, Jason, great question. So you're probably going to have to figure out what that inner diameter of the coolant hose is. I wouldn't personally want to start drilling and tapping the block. Not only is that way more work than I want to do, but it also, you know, you run the risk of things like doing it wrong and maybe drilling a hole wrong or running a tap in wrong putting metal in the system, all the issues that come about. For me, if I were doing this, what I would want to do is I would probably want to cut the radiator hose and install it in line. Think of like a T fitting. That way we can make one cut in the hose, maybe two if we need to shorten up the length of it and put it right in the hose, thread our sensor in and we're good to go. But like you said, you're gonna need to know the inner diameter of that hose. So what do we do to learn the inner diameter? couple of things we can do. We can take a trip to the junkyard with maybe some digital calipers and measure what one of the coolant flanges is, or maybe we can take those same digital calipers and go over to the dealership and see if they have one. I bet you they would let you measure. Usually if you're cool with them, they're pretty cool about you doing stuff like that too. But I really don't like the idea of drilling and tapping and all that stuff in the head just to install a temperature sensor, which by the way, I totally agree with you. Not having the temperature sensor on the Beetle makes no sense to me, even if it were a little digital thing that could be in the screen. I, I don't know why they didn't put it in there. I, many, many years ago, learned, do not try and figure out why they did things the way they did things, because oftentimes the answer is, I have no idea. So I would want to install it in line in that upper radiator hose as close to where the factory coolant temperature sensor is. That way the temperature you're reading is gonna be really close. So if we can get it you know, within six inches or so of that OEM coolant temp sensor, that's probably the best way to do it. Now what you might be able to do, depending on how your temperature sensor works, is maybe we can tee in to that temperature sensor that's already there and already exists and use it. Uh, I don't really know if your gauge is gonna work that way. It may work the other way with the, uh, with the sensor that they gave you. So we're probably gonna have to do a little more research on figuring out really what the best way to add that is. But for me, I like the idea of just putting in a T-piece in that upper coolant hose, upper radiator hose, and going that direction. That seems to be the least intrusive and the least area for problems when you consider having to drill and tap you know, the block or the head. And I don't know offhand if there's any like plugs or anything that are in one of the coolant jackets. I know like the two liter non-turbos had a little plug in them you could take out and put an oil pressure sensor in it or an oil temperature sensor in, but I don't really think they had anything for coolant. So that's probably the direction I would go. I might even consider going to the junkyard hopefully finding a 1.8 turbo beetle. Those weren't the most common out there and there's a handful of different engine codes 
that it could be for that that beetle, depending on what year. You didn't let me know what year, and uh, a lot of that stuff I've downloaded anyway, so I may not know it off the top of my head. But there were some that actually did have a little coolant flange piece in the radiator hose that I think it was the fan switch that was that sensor uh, in the upper radiator hose, and it had a regular coolant temp sensor in the coolant flange on top of that. So. Go that route, man. You know, that that that, oh, that hose is probably about yay big. I don't know. What is that? An inch and a half or so, give or take. Um, if anybody knows that measurement, like lickety split off the top of their head, drop that down in the comments. I would probably want to do some test fitting, though, and make 100% sure that I got the right one. And really, to me, the best way to do that is either pay three bucks, go into the junkyard, see if you can find one uh, and use that and measure it or buy it and take the hose with you so you have a backup in case you need to make multiple cuts or something like that. Always good to have one of those hoses in reserve when we start adding things onto it. All right, next one up is from TJ. The headlights on my car will turn themselves off intermittently, normally at night, of course normally at night. Do you have any guidance as to where I could start the troubleshooting process? I have an O3 Jetta GLI 24 valve VR6, six speed manual transmission. This past week I was driving the car early in the morning and the heater fan on high trying to dry out the interior, which is a problem for a different time according to TJ, but that may actually be something you wanna keep in the back of your mind while you're looking at the rest of this. As I was driving, the headlights cut off and the blower motor cut off. Two things happening, good, good to keep that in mind too. A few minutes later, the headlights and the fan came back on and a few minutes later, they cut back off. I drove the car around most of the day with the lights on and the fan running, but didn't get the car to recreate the issue again. Talked to my father-in-law who was an old mechanic. He said I would start looking at the ignition switch, which I'm inclined to agree, but was wondering if you had come across a problem like this before. Also forgot to mention the car has been in a deer strike a couple of years ago and has been on and off the road since then and has aftermarket headlights in it right now and has been wired for fog lights before the deer strike. I just cut the fog light wiring out to hopefully rewire it back to stock and do a cleaner job. Okay, TJ, a couple of things. First, we wanna make sure it's not the headlights. This is what I would do. Uh, your father-in-law, by the way, is probably spot on with it being an ignition switch problem. One, insanely common thing on Mark IVs to have bad ignition switches. Two, we don't have just the headlights failing, we have other things turning off as well. What I would do if you could recreate this is see if you can operate the buttons for the windows or something else and see if anything else is failing other than just the blower motor and the headlights. Odds are this is an ignition switch. There's two screws in the clamshell for the steering column trim. You can pop those two screws, they come up they're tiny Phillips or tiny T20s, depending your year probably is T20s. Take those out, lift the cover up, and you can look down and see the ignition switch. You're gonna wanna look for any burnt wires or anything like that. They don't always burn the end of the wire, but oftentimes they do. It's also really easy to unscrew the ignition switch and test it if you wanted to. If you can get a test light down in there, even better, great way to test it. So I'm thinking your father-in-law is probably on the right track, but let me give you a couple of other things to check. Go through and look at your wiring up front. You said it was a bunch of years ago you had the deer strike, so I'm guessing it's had the aftermarket headlights for a while. It's probably nothing to do with that. Just look and make sure you don't have any loose connections. Also, it's you mentioned something about drying the car out. Be sure you don't have any water damage behind the dashboard. If you do, I have actually seen Two cars, I think, have Jettas, both Jettas, one was silver, I don't remember the other color of that one, um, leak water into the car and actually soak the fuse panel. That's not common, but it has happened. Often it's times it was a windshield, I think, that caused the leak to get into the fuse panel. So I had one where the reverse lights wouldn't work. I think the other one was a DRL relay that uh, was full of water. That's another thing you want to take a look at too. Those two things together are probably not going to be related as far as like the headlight relay, the fan and the headlights. When it's something, just pull the relay out and take a look at it. Make sure you don't have any obvious rust or anything like that on the relay and on the contacts in the fuse panel. We all are on the relay panel. We also want to look at the fuse panel. You know, shine your light. Make sure you don't have any rust or oxidation there. On your Mark IV, um, if you open that little fuse door on the side of the dash, the fuses, uh, the small fuses in the upper right are all lighting fuses. So you can pull a couple of those out one at a time, make sure they go back exactly where they came from. 
and look at those and see if they have any water damage as well. But I'm with, uh, with the father-in-law on this one, probably an ignition switch. Don't just shotgun one in there. Do a little bit of research and investigation and diagnosis first to rule other things out. And if you have a test light, you know, we can put our test light on and check each position of the ignition switch. If for some reason you can get it to do it, um, you can jiggle the ignition, the key, and see if that makes them come on or go off. Please don't do that while you're driving. Do it while your car is running, sitting in a parking lot. Those Mark IVs actually have kind of hidden, well, they're not really hidden because they're there, but kind of hidden ignition switch positions where you can unlock the steering column without actually turning the ignition on. So fiddle with the switch, that may get it. Also uh, flip the lever down and move the steering wheel in and out and up and down. Sometimes that puts the ignition switch in a happy place. Sometimes it makes it mad. Uh, so I, I would usually flip that down and move the steering wheel up and down and in and out, see if that impacted what was going on in any way. So man, that's where I'd be at again. Most likely like 86%, it's gonna be the ignition switch, but do those couple extra check checks. It'll just take you a minute or two to do it. And then uh, if you wanna order an ignition switch, they're probably only like 40 bucks, super easy to replace. You only need to take that column trim off and then you'll see two red dots of paint on the cylinder that holds the ignition switch and the key lock cylinder. Just ground, dig the paint out of there with a small flat blade screwdriver, loosen those set screws, and you can pull the switch right out. Super duper easy. I should do a video on it. It's so easy. Sometimes you got to take the steering column, uh, the steering wheel off to get the column trim off. That may pose a little bit of difficulty, but even that's not super hard, uh, even for a DIYer, even without the right high dollar special tool. In fact, I always made my own airbag removal tool, taking a sweet craftsman small screwdriver and just bending it to 90 degrees worked perfectly. If you're real trick, you can bend the tip of that screwdriver down just a little. That helps too. But um, it's they're pretty easy to get off either which way. I actually did a video on doing it on a cabrio. You can follow those uh, those instructions because it'll be pretty much the same. All right, next one up is from Max, and it's a motorcycle question, which I'm excited about because I don't think I've ever answered a motorcycle question. Hey, Charles, I've been refurbishing my Suzuki Bandit 600 motorcycle. Replace the clutch springs, everything but the calipers and discs for the front brake, spark plugs, battery, added some 44K, outstanding, I use 44K as well. I also want, of course, want to make it look new. However, I ran into some trouble. My main goal for aesthetics was to get rid of all the white oxidation off my aluminum engine, but I can't seem to get it off. I've tried Scotch-Brite, a wire wheel, all sorts of chemicals, even tried lightly brushing with a wire drill, bit, but I'm worried about scraping up the engine and making it look even worse. How can I get rid of this oxidation and make it look new? Thanks, Max. All right, Max, um, there are a billion, billion ways to clean aluminum. I think for you, the tricky part is going to be cleaning in all the little crevices and notches and stuff like that. So um, what I would do, first of all, I would make sure that I did this in a place that maybe wasn't so obvious and out in the open, like what do they tell you when you're um, using carpet cleaner to try it in a hidden area? I might try some of these in a hidden area and I might try a couple of them. First thing that comes to mind is vinegar. Vinegar works really, really well for cleaning. I think it's usually like a 50-50 vinegar water mixture. Some people say warming it up actually helps it as well. Uh, I also read about, and I've never done this one, lime or lemon juice, lemon juice, lemon juice. It was yellow, lemon juice. I get lemons and limes confused sometimes. Lemon juice and salt mixed together works really, really well. The key is not to leave any of this stuff on there too long. The other thing I would do, man, is I would look at some aluminum cleaner for wheels, right? There's tons of different products, Meguiar's and all the other really good quality products out there for cleaning aluminum wheels. And it's gonna come in a nice spray thing, it's gonna have easy directions like spray on cool wheel, let sit five minutes and hose off. So if this were me, what I would do is I would probably start with a wheel cleaner, spray it on, let it sit for a couple minutes. Some of them are really cool, they'll turn purple when they're you know activating or whatever. Spray it on, let it sit for the amount of time that it says it does, and then spray it off, dry it off, and see how it looks. Then if you need to go something a little more mechanical, now we can look at maybe doing that salt lemon juice mixture because that's going to provide a bit of a scrub. Um, I think you would probably want to use like a sponge or something like that to, um, to clean that. Really, it depends on how much work you want to do and how much like hardcore chemicals you want to use. I've read a lot about muriatic acid cleaning aluminum. I don't think I would want to use that on my engine, but it may be just fine. Also, it's different if you had the engine in the bike, 
you know, you're trying to clean it installed versus that cylinder head or engine, depending on which parts are aluminum, I'm guessing probably just the cylinder head uh, on the bench working on it. I'm going to probably be okay with using a little harsher chemicals while it's sitting on the bench versus while it's in the car. I don't want to get that chemicals on the frame of my bike or on any electrical stuff and that kind of thing. That's why I like the vinegar. It's going to be super safe. The lime and salt going to be super safe. The wheel cleaner going to be super safe because if they weren't, we'd have issues with wheel cleaners destroying ABS sensors and brake calipers and things like that. So, um, dude, try that. I'll actually drop a link down below to a handful of things on Amazon if you want to check it out. Buy it there. Cool. Appreciate that. If you don't, no worries either. There's also another product called Barkeeper's Friend that I know a lot of people use to clean exhaust tips. And I actually need to test drive that on the R32 because the exhaust tips are terrible. Um, so that may be something else you want to look at. It kind of depends on like how you're going to apply this. For me, because I'm ultra lazy about stuff like this, I just want to go and wait and then hose it off and see how it looks. But again, I'm super lazy. You may want to get in there with something a little bit more mechanical and uh, do a better job. And I think that is awesome. And congratulations, man. And thank you for sending me a motorcycle question. That's pretty darn cool. All right, last one of the day comes from Eric. Hey, Charles, your content is great, dude. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. If you get a chance, I have a question. I filled my new to me 07 GTI with gas. I stuck the gas nozzle in, walked into the store. After that, my car smelled like gas for weeks. More so when I get on it and I'm getting a code for a large EVAP leak. Could that be the N80 valve or the charcoal canister? I can't see if anyone else having these failures cause a strong smell of gas. Any thoughts would help. Thank you for your time. All right, Eric, this stinks. Literally, ha <laughs> ha, funny dad joke Sunday. Anyway, um, so it could be the N80 valve. It could be more likely the charcoal canister than the N80 valve. Typically the N80 valve, if it fails, you may get a leak. You'll probably get a flow code as well. Um, maybe also piled on with a system rich issue or a system lean issue. It could kind of go either way. If you filled your tank till it clicked off and that's it, we might actually be dealing with some kind of issue with the vent lines on the tank. It really depends on where this smells. What I would do is I would pull the back seat up. Um, there's clips in the front that you pop up and then you actually have to shove it back and get the little bracket out of the hook. And then you can flip the back seat up on the passenger side, right underneath where the rear passenger would sit. There's a cover with three or screws, or this doesn't have screws. This is just a plastic cover, I think. Pop that cover off and see if you have any standing fuel. What can happen in what I have seen, now this could be a couple of different things, but what I've seen is two things. One, the seal for the fuel tank not sealing, or two, rodent damage or critter damage to some of the lines that run across the top of the tank. Either one of those, what happens is as you fill the tank before it cuts off, it actually overfills the tank a little bit and pools gasoline on top of the tank. Now, even though this is outside of your car, it's like right up under your car, open raw fuel. So of course you're gonna smell it really, really strong. And even with the back seat in and that cover on, it doesn't matter. You're still going to smell it. That's where I would start. Maybe. I might also pop the hood and just stick my face down there and see if I'm smelling any raw fuel under the hood. Because if you are, okay, now maybe we have a fuel line issue. But I don't think like you filling it with gas and having that issue would mate up at all. You would have had that issue anyway. And then, you know, the, the filling up with fuel wouldn't have added to that problem, but it's worth popping the hood, right? How easy is it to pop the hood, stick your face under there, hopefully not with the car running, especially if you have a big stupid beard like I do, um, or you know, if you don't, you can do it with the car running. Either way, give it a couple good sniffs. You should be able to smell raw fuel very easily, especially compared to like an oil leak or something like that. If you didn't get anything there, then pop that back seat up and see what you got. You can also slide under the car in that same location, right in front of the right rear tire is your fuel filter. So you have lines that come from your tank to your fuel filter and up to the front of the car. Maybe we have an issue with a fuel line there. We can also probably look there to see if we have any fuel leaking on the ground. You can do that first before pulling the back seat up. For me, I wanna look at the top of the tank too. So it's really up to you. Is it easier to slide underneath real quick and go, looks dry to me? or is it easier to pop the back seat up? 
Honestly, if you got a four door, pop the back seat up because it's way easier. If you got a two door, maybe stick your head underneath and see what it looks like. See if you can see any trailing or witness marks from fuel leaking off the top of the tank or out of one of those lines. That's probably what it is. It might be something in the charcoal canister. Maybe that pump didn't click off fast enough and it did overfill and filled the charcoal canister. This is a new to you car. Maybe the previous owner would fill it and then bump it up to the next round dollar, which a lot of people do, which I don't recommend because you end up f eventually filling the charcoal canister with fuel. So do those things, man. That's a pretty easy thing to look at. And luckily, or unfortunately, fuel has a very strong, very distinct smell. You're smelling it in the cabin, you know what it smells like. As we move around the car, it should get stronger the closer we get to the source. And uh, you'll probably find that there's some kind of issue back at the tank, back at the fuel filter, the fuel lines near the tank. That's gonna be where my guess is. Of course, like with all of these, these are just my guesses, but hopefully that gives you at least something to do, something to check, something to look at yourself, rather than having to immediately pay a hundred bucks to somebody so they can pull the back seat up and go, yep, you got a leaking fuel tank seal uh, right here. We can see it. We got raw fuel on top of the tank. If you find that that's what the problem is and the seal is leaking at the top of the tank, that's a pretty easy DIY. You'll have to knock the ring around um, and that's not too hard. Or, you know, if you'd rather take that to someone else to let them do that, I don't blame you. Working with fuel is not super fun. So that one I get both sides of wanting to do it to save money and not wanting to do it because you don't want to breathe fuel. The trick is don't do it on a full tank and you really don't need to pull the tank uh, pump all the way out. You can just lift it up enough to get the old seal out, swing the new seal on, drop it back in. I usually put a little dielectric grease on the seal to make sure that it slides in properly because it is actually kind of easy to get that off centered a little bit and pinch the seal as you slam it down or slide it down and uh, into the tank. So. Take your time if you're gonna do it. Just don't do it on a full tank because when you pop that sending unit out, you'll actually get fuel spill out and definitely don't want that. So there you go, Eric. I hope that helps. Guys, with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. Questions, comments, drop them down below. I'm still fighting this pollen allergy thing. Ugh, it's been driving me nuts for like two weeks almost now. Uh, if you guys have questions, don't forget to email me, charles at humblemechanic.com. Thank you guys so much for watching. Or if you're listening, thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you again next time.